I'm going to talk to you about something that is very important. That subject matter is idolatrous influence in scripture. We try to get through all of this today. Today I'm entering into Yahweh's court of law. I'm posing before the court of law as an attorney. He's the judge, and the jury is filled with the prophets, and I'm the prosecuting attorney today. Your excellent most high, El, Yahweh, I solemnly affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Religion is filled with idolatrous terminology that you may not know as idolatrous as you do not know the origin of many of the words that appear in biblical texts. Many of these words have spilled into our Hebraic narrative. Why has these come to the fore now? Well, it's because knowledge has increased. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4 says to us, But you, Daniel, keep these words secret and seal up the book until the time of the end. Many will rush here and there as knowledge increases. This particular prophecy comes to fruition in 1985 with the opening of the World Wide Web. Being Hebrew and understanding Hebrew texts, wherein the Most High El does not cater to any aspect of idolatry, it is important to know what these are. If a person is serious about serving the Creator and their salvation is important, idolatry will be a very big stumbling block. I want to start with one of the most important words that there is. I'm not going to exhaust this subject today. I'm going to have to carry it over. However, we will continue to build on this subject. The first I want to deal with is the name of the Most High, the Father, the Creator, and why it is that I don't use a term God in reference to the spirit of all creation. God, dad, good, are all interrelated terminologies and names. Your origin is pagan, derived from Syrian or Canaanite deity of good luck or fortune. God is a common Teutonic Germanic word that was applied to superhuman beings of heathen mythologies. The word God was adopted. I want you to hear me. I'm going to repeat that again. It was adopted by Christianity as the generic name for the creator. Blessed be he as a replacement for the father's true name, yod He vav He Yahweh. I want to go back and say this again. It was adopted. 
it was adopted. God is not written in any manuscript that is associated with what we term to be the Masoretic text from which our scriptures come from. It is interesting to me that most religions know the name of their deity, but one of the world's largest religious religions, Christianity, does not know the name of theirs. Jesus, Yeshua, is not the name of the Most High El. Before I bring further clarity to the term God, we also have to look at another word. The origin of the term Lord. The usage of the word Lord has been substituted in scripture, introduced into Eurocentric Bibles. I want you to get this number now. Some 6,823 times. It has been used that many times for the name of the true name of the Creator. So in Eurocentric Bibles, the interchanging of God and Lord are replacements for the true name of the Most High El. I use the wording introduced by Eurocentrics because the history of the Bible centers around their influence. Allow me to present the number of Bibles influenced by Eurocentrics. The Septuagint was, came into existence in the 3rd to 1st century B.C. The Latin Vulgate, about 400 A.D., the work of Jerome, used by the Roman Catholic Church. The Wycliffe Bible in 1383, the Tyndale New Testament in 1626, the Cloverdale in 1535, the Great Bible in 1539, the Geneva Bible in 1560, the Reims New Testament in 1582, the Douay in Old Testament in 1610, the King James in 1611, which is one of the Bibles that has been mostly used amongst many religious circles. The English Revised Version in 1881 to 1885. The American Standard Version in 1901. The Moffat Bible in 1913 to 1924, the Smith Godspeed translation in 1923, the 1927, the Revised Standard Version 1946 to 1952, the Phillips New Testament in 1958, the Berkeley the Bar the, the Berkeley Vision version in 1959. The New English Bible, 1951 to 1970. Today's English Version, New Testament, 1958. The Living Bible, 1971. The New Standard Version, 1974. The King James, ver the New King James Version in 1979. And the New International Version in 1979. And since then, there is a listing of many more that have been written. 
I want you to take note that none of these works that I have mentioned are influenced by any body of melanated color, nor do any of them hold to the Mazor or the Masoretic text, which is much more consistent in structure and text than any manuscript of Christian Bibles, a quote from Dr. Christopher de Hamel, whose doctorate is from the Oxford University. His work has become a standard work amongst the Christian world. He has also written, writes, and I quote, that throughout the Middle Ages, throughout the Middle Ages, in where? Europe. There were more biblical commentaries than any other area of literature, literary endeavor, and there were certainly more manuscripts of biblical commentaries in most medieval libraries than there were of Bibles itself. Why do I bring this up? I bring this up because you need to know the influence for which over centuries and decades of time that we have been reading and holding up a work that we have declared as to be the inerrant word of El. That inerrant word of El that we held up is the work of Eurocentric influence who have not a clue. I'm going to say this again to you. Who have not a clue what the Masoretic text that the Most High spoke and gave to Hebrew Israel consists of and what it says. Therefore, listening to the Eurocentric commentaries and the influence that they have placed on Scripture, for which you testify that all Scripture is Yah breathes valuable for teaching the truth and, and, and correcting and right living, that work has been influenced by Eurocentric minds and altered to make you believe something that is not true. As stated, this terminology God and Lord is used in all Bibles created by Eurocentric writers. However, there are Bibles written in this age by people who are influenced by the Mazor or the Masoretic text where correct terminology exists. El, the Mighty One, Most High, Yahweh, is the correct form or the correct way to refer to the Creator. And here are some biblical works that follow the Masoretic Scripture. So if I'm going to show one, we have to be fair and we have to show the other. Hebraic Bibles, the complete Jewish Bible by David Stern. It's a good work. It has some things in it that we have to search out. The Hebrew Roots Bible by the Congregation of Yahweh. The Scriptures by the Institute of Scripture Research, South Africa. The Restoration Scriptures True Edition Study Bible by the RestorationScriptures.org. So these works are going to have in it the true name of the Most High, and they're going to reflect the language that is most assimilate it with the Mazora and the Masoretic text. Now, let's look at some text, my favorite text, here in Shemot chapter 3, verse number 13. 
it says, And Masha said to El, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and say to them, The El of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? The El said unto Masha, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. The El said, Moreover to Masha, I want you to pay attention to the letters in red. This is the American Standard Version. Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Jehovah, or Jehovah, the El of your fathers, the El of Abraham, the El of Yitzchak, the El of, and the El of ya ya Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial unto all generations. I need you to pay attention to how the wording is placed there. The King James Version of text and other versions of text do not even have this portion of text in it. Therefore, you wouldn't know what the true name of the Most, of the Most High is. Let me go back to my opening statement. The reason why it is that I don't use the word G-O-D as a reference to the Creator is because I've already shown you historically its origin and its reference as being associated with mythology and heathenism. And I've also shared with you the fact that Christianity adopted the name God. They adopted it. That means it wasn't in any of the information that they had. They adopted it and put it in there. So we have to look at these things here and see. Now let me see if I can get my next slide here up. Here we uh oh. Come on. Here we come on. Go back. There we go. Now, side by side here are the two texts, and I just posted the text from the Mazora or the Masoretic from this particular text in Shemot chapter 3, verse 13. We shall read. What is his name? What am I to tell them? Elohim said to Mashe, Iye, I share Iye, I am, will be what I am will be, and added, here is what you say to the people of Israel. Iye, I am, or I will be, has sent me to you. Elohim said further to Mashe, say this to the people of Israel. Now, this is written in the Masoretic text. yod heh vav -Heh, or Yahweh, the Elohe of your fathers, the Elohe of Abraham, the Elohe of Yitzchak, and the Elohe of Yaakov, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is how I am to be remembered generation after generation. I come back across into the American Standard Version. I didn't post the King James. But you will note that the name of the Most High is not mentioned in the text. Many people refer to him as Jehovah. That's not his name. This is very important as we move forward in our understanding that it is important to know what the true name of the Creator is. Because your life, your soul, your spirit, and your true deliverance depends upon knowing what the name of the Most High is. I take you now to two texts on the right here, or on the left, whichever one is there, is a text that is written in the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse number 13. And it says, 
Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But now remember something. It's recorded that over 6,823 times the word Lord has been substituted for the Father's name. And in our prior text, they used the word Jehovah, also not the Father's name. Lord is a title. God is a title and not a name. Many people will say that the Father has many names. I beg to differ with you. The Father doesn't have many names. He has many titles and many references that define his actions. They are not names. They are titles that define his actions. Let's read the text of Romans and compare it with the source text in Joel chapter 3, verse 5. Hebrew scriptures, Joel chapter 2, verse 32. So let's look here for a minute and let's see here. Let's go to Joel. It says the same thing, but there's a difference. The difference here is, in Joel 3 and 5, it says, at that time, the letters in gold are very important. At that time, whoever calls on the name of Yahweh will be saved. In order to understand what's going on here, we have to go back and read the pretext of Joel and then map it against the text of Romans chapter 10, to see if there's any correlation between them. As I go there, there is a golden rule in Torah mitzvot. Devarim chapter 4, verse number 2. It says, do not add to what I'm saying and do not subtract from it. Devarim chapter 13 verse 1, or in, in other Bibles, chapter 12, verse 32, everything I'm commanding you, you are to take care to do. Do not add to it, nor are you to subtract from it. The matter here is very important because we have to go back and we have to look at some language in Romans chapter 10, in terms of addition and subtraction. This is the text from the New Testament where inserts of Hebrew text has been placed. Hebraically, the golden rule of addition has been broken. The text in red is an addition that does not appear in the original text of Devarim, or Deuteronomy, chapter 30, verse 11. Let's read. Romans chapter 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to El, for Yisrael, is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of El, but not according to knowledge. Uh, we'll come back and deal with this at a later time. For they being ignorant of Yahweh's righteousness, mm, them, uh, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of El. Uh, I submit to you that all of that is um, a little twisted. For, watch this now, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Let's pause here for a minute. If the Most High has established something that's permanent throughout all your generations, then how can we come along and say that a man has ended it to everyone that believe it? That's an addition. For Masha described the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, 
say thine, say not in thy heart, who shall ascend into heaven? This is an addition. That is to bring Christ down from above. This is not endeavoring. Or who shall ascend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. That's an insertion. But what saith it? That the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, in thy heart, that word which we preach. Now, let's look at this particular text in the Mazor or in the Hebrew writing. Because what I just read to you out of, out of, out of Romans chapter 10, where they, have le- where they speak these words, it comes out of Devarim chapter 30, verse 11. Let's read. And he calls it, the Most High calls it, this, for this mitzvah, which I'm giving you today, is not too hard for you. It is not beyond your reach. It isn't in the sky, so that you need to ask who will go up into the sky for us. Bring it to us and make us hear it. So that we can say, likewise, it isn't beyond the sea. So that we need to ask who will, uh, who will cross the sea for us, bring it to us, and make us hear it. So that we can obey it. On the contrary, the word is very close to you, in your mouth, even in your heart. Therefore, you can do it. Do you see anywhere in the Hebrew text where there's even a hint, the mention of Christos, Christ, could be where he could even be a forethought in the text. So the Greeks, the Eurocentrics, have inserted into their text this narrative that if we go back, I can go back to the red, all of this, all of this, all of this is breaking the golden rule of do not add to nor take away from what I am saying. This does not reside in the text that they have inserted into the text that would cause you to believe that what they're saying here pertains to anybody other than the Most High. With that being the case, let's get down to the issue here. Because the issue in Romans chapter 10 is this verse 13, which says in Romans, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and shalt believe in thy heart that El hath raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. I want you to. I want you to. I want you to put a pin in that portion right there. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith. Now watch this now. For the Scripture saith. We're going back into the Hebrew text. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Okay. For there is no difference between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord, once again we interject the word Lord in here, over all is rich unto all who call upon him. Therefore, verse 13, for whosoever shall call up on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, there's much to say about this whole chapter 10 text concerning the inserts from the Hebrew text being completely out of context to the Hebrew text. 
but that's for another day. Remember, I said that it's important to know the name of the Most High. They have inserted into, into their text there in Romans the fact that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But we know that in the book of Joel, as we look at the book of Joel, that the book of Joel is not talking about anything except the fact that there is a time frame which is called the Messianic Era. The Messianic Era is a time frame in which that the Most High is going to regather the nation of Israel as he has spoken in text from all the four corners of the earth and bring them back to their land. That is a covenant that the Most High has spoken to our ancestors. Our ancestors violated the Torah and their relationship with the Most High, which has caused us to be placed in this particular exile that we're in. Being in this exile, we have become subjected to idolatry, idolatrous language, idolatrous ways of life. Joel chapter 3 talks about the day and time in which that the Most High is going to do some things in relationship to the redemption of his people. Therefore, he speaks about a time frame. Let's see. Um, Sister Teresa, can you bring up Joel chapter number 3 for me, please? Let's so take a minute to, to kind of talk about this and, 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 and spread it out here. There are things that you will never hear in the Christian church that is about a messianic era, that is about a redemption and a restoration of Hebrew Israel back into the land. Land. While the Christian church and the nations are going to heaven, exiled Hebrew Israel is going back to land. It's important to know this. Take me all the way. Take me, take me up a little, take me back up some more. Now, he talks about, take me all the way, yeah, take me all the way to there. And we will read it down. Right there. He says, there are some things in chapter number two, but then he says, after this, I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. And also your male and female slaves. Notice the words. In those days, I will pour out my spirit. I will show wonders in the sky and the earth, blood and fire and the columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great, now watch this now, before the coming of the great and terrible day of Yahweh. Now, right there. So when we read, there's a lot of verbiage here in Joel that happens to also exist in the book of Revelations. This is where they got it from. They didn't come up with that in the New Testament on their own. They pulled that out of Joel and pasted it into their Revelations writing to make you think that it's them talking. It's not them talking. It's Joel that's talking, and the narrative is completely out of context. Notice that he says that these things will come 
before the coming of the great and terrible day of Yahweh. Now, you have to know some history, some prophetic, some prophetic history as to what he's talking about before the great and terrible day. We are going to be influenced, or not influenced, we're going to be subjected to a time in which that the Most High is going to wage war. That war that he's going to rage is talked about in Scripture as the war against the nations. What nations? Gog and Magog. Now, you can find the writings about Gog and Magog in Bereshit chapter number 10, where the genealogies of the sons of Noah are so mentioned, of which within those, within those genealogies where the sons are mentioned, we find that Japhat or Yephat is one of Noah's sons from whom come the Oxenazis and also the nations of Gog and Magog are mentioned. Gog and Magog make up all of the Eurocentric nations in the world. Now, I've shown you, I've shown you historically the origin and the dates and times and frames in which the majority of Bibles have been written and provided to us. All of those Bibles along with the commentaries that go with them, historians have already told us that the influence is by medieval Eurocentrics. The medieval Eurocentrics don't have a single clue. By reading their commentaries, I know this, because I have their commentaries. As a matter of fact, one of the Bibles that I mentioned there of the Eurocentrics, I forget which one it is, is a Bible, it's a very large Bible. It's about this thick and about this high. I have those in my library. They're probably, they're probably valuable to somebody now. They need to be rebound because they've all come apart. But I, I have those big works from the beginning as that go back to those dates. So, what's taking place here in chapter 3? Chapter 3 is that the Most High is going to wage war amongst the nations, the nations who have been not favorable to Israel, Gog and Magog. So he says, at that time, at that time, when he begins to wage war against those nations, at that time, whoever calls on the name of Yahweh will be delivered. At that time. At that time. Now, why is there a necessity to call upon the name of the Most High at that time? Now, there's, there's, there's something critical here, okay? The most important part of what's being said here is that you need to know what name to call on at that time. It's not Lord. It's not God. God and Lord will not deliver you at that time. Now remember, remember, Lord has been insectured into text over 6,800 plus times. And every time, in the majority of your Bibles, when you see the word Lord or call up on the name of Lord, you think Lord is Jesus Christ. Lord is not Jesus Christ. Lord is the creator of all things who says in the beginning, I am the first, I am the last, and beside me there is no other. So if you're going to be conflicted and need to know what's true, the name of the Most High, El, is very important. 
You can call him Yahweh. You can call him Yahqua. You can call him Yahuwah. But don't call him. Watch this now. 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 You know what you say? Don't call me out of my name. Don't call. If somebody approaches you and calls you out of your name, you get very indignant about that. And if somebody calls you that knows your name and they don't use your name, you get very indignant about that. The Most High is very indignant about his name. And he says in the Masoretic text, everywhere that he has written something that's important, he's so proud of his name that he signs his name. I am Yahweh. I want to use a phrase I can't use. <laughs> Let me see how I can preface it. If the Most High <laughs> destroys something or somebody, or in text, he does something that's awesome or great, he signs it, I am Yahweh. So he's very specific in terms of what he says. So at that time, at the time when war is declared amongst the nations for which many of you, probably not us, but there will be people who will be alive at that time that are going to have to go through this. It's what the text say, it's a terrible time. It's a terrible time. If you're going to be delivered, I'm not bashing, I'm not bashing, I, I really am not bashing Jesus Christ or Yeshua. I'm only going to text here where he says, you better know my name. Now, how important is that to us today? Well, it's very important to us today. And one of the significant reasons why it's important to us today is because our people, melanated people, all over the world are being treated very badly. But there's a reason for it. And we keep asking the question, how long is this going to go on? Well, you have a historical document. It's called the Book of Judges. If you go into the book of Judges and you read the book of Judges, you will find that Israel was always subject to oppressors until, and the, the, the word until, until what happened? Until somebody cried out and somebody made, made it known to, made it known to what the issue really was. So as we look at this particular text, the prophecy of Joel, as I indicated earlier, covers several aspects of history of the Hebrew people. Chapter 3 is specific to the Messianic era, the seventh day, in which the anointed king of Israel, King David, Yahweh's anointed king, the Messiah, deliverer of Israel, will be king. I kind of got ahead of myself. I didn't know I had the text here. I forgot I had the text here in my, in my, uh, in my slide. Now, the language of the text, if we look at it, study it thoroughly, going back to Joel chapter 3, has a lot of metaphorical references. However, none of them point to Jesus Christ or Yeshua. The prophet speaks in text about what Yahweh will do to the many nations. A reference to Gog and Magog in the end of days is stated 
as verse 5 states at that time, who's going to escape the wrath of the Most High, those who call upon the name, and what the name Yod, Hey, Bob, Hey, will, will save them, Yahweh. So it's important to know the name of the Father, even in this exile. It is by the name that men are delivered in the Messianic era, and King David will be king forever. Yahweh, who has chosen him to be the king over Israel forever. Now, I want to go somewhere, and I want to go back to my, to my thought. Why is it important? What has idolatry got to do with anything? The word God and the word Lord are very subtle. We've been using them for eons. We've been praying, Father God. Father God, in the name of now, we have a problem Hebraically. We have a problem Hebraically. And the problem Hebraically is we have a mitzvot. And that mitzvot tells us that we are not supposed to mention the name of any other L. Not capital L. Little L. We're not supposed to mention it. It's difficult because the insertion of so much into the Greek narrative is placed that in order to get you to understand, we have to go there. But I hope you have an opportunity to listen to this lesson over and over again because I declare to you that I am going to try my best, my, as they say, my darndest. And whatever explanation and teaching I'm doing where I need to have to do that, I'm not. Because if I do, I violate a principle law of the Most High. Now, the text in Romans 10 said that he, the Elohim of the Greeks, said that he was the end of the law. I have a problem with that. And I want you to hear me, and I want you to understand something. Please understand. Can, even if he was, he would be a servant of the Most High. Can a servant be greater than his master? Can a servant usurp his master. Not at all. So if a servant cannot usurp his master, then the servant can't replace what the master has put in place. And if the master has said, this shall be throughout all your generations, then who has the right to change that? Nobody. Nobody. We go back to the book of Numbers by Midbar, when the Most High says and declares to us, I am not a human. I am not a man. That I should lie. And certainly that I don't change my mind. What I have said, I will bring into fruition. One of the problems that we're confronted with is the fact that we have a misunderstanding of what the Most High is doing. And the reason why we have this misunderstanding is because 
We've been influenced by a Eurocentric mindset. The nations of people, they seek knowledge. And so they're looking for knowledge. But if we look at our ancestors, the Hebrew family of Israel, we're not looking for knowledge. We have the knowledge of the Most High. So if I go back to Romans, where he says that Israel lacks understanding and knowledge. No, 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 no. As a matter of fact, let's see if we, oh, let me get the right one here. Let's go back there for a minute. I got a minute to go back there. If we look at this text, where it says, They being ignorant of Yahweh's righteousness. Israel wasn't ignorant of Yahweh's righteousness. Israel, when they operated correctly, they walked in righteousness, which was the Torah, the laws, the rules, and the instructions of the Most High, which he said, do not add to or do not take away from. So they weren't ignorant. They knew what righteousness was. They knew how to get there. And the problem is, once again, the influence of this text is not Hebraic. The influence of this text is Eurocentric. Therefore, you're all messed up. Now, back to this. Uh oh, didn't want to do that. Let's bring it back. Uh -uh. Didn't want to do that. F furthermore, we can't say that somebody does away with something when they don't have the authority to do away with it. No authority at all. Now the question becomes one, class, does truth matter? I can raise my hand to the Most High El, and I can solemnly affirm today in his presence that what I have told you is the truth, nothing but the truth, so help me El. You can verify and you can, you can, you can, you can check it out. The book of Habakkuk provides for us these words concerning the Most High's people. He says, my people, Hebrew Israel, is destroyed for the want of knowledge or the lack of knowledge. I submit to you that we have to stop being bobbleheads and agreeing with everything that comes over the pulpit without verification. Why is that important to you? It's important to you because your soul's deliverance depends on truth. I'm not going to any doctor. I'm not going into any operating room with any surgeon who's not qualified on the basis of fact and truth that's going to put a knife to my body because my life depends on it. A few years ago, 
I underwent surgery for cancer in one of my lungs. I had to have the lung removed. If I didn't have confidence in the surgeon that he knew truth and he knew what he was doing, I would not be here today to speak to you. I would be dead. Consequently, your deliverance and your salvation in the end of days is dependent upon truth. Not just because somebody can make a noise and somebody can shout the loudest and somebody can, 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 can get you all worked up. What are they saying to you that's truth? What are they saying to you that your soul can depend upon? Stop dancing the jig. And come to resonate and realize that the Most High and He alone espouses truth. Therefore, I say to you, Today, turn to the Most High, Yahweh, with all your heart and soul. Yerarekaka, Yahweh v'ishmerekaka. Ya'er, Yahweh p'nav, aleka, v'kanuka. Yesa, Yahweh p'nav, aleka, v'yasham, laka, shalom. May Yahweh bless you. May Yahweh's blessings be upon you. May Yahweh make his face to shine on you and show you favor. May Yahweh lift up his face toward you and give you shalom. All of these are necessity for our way of life and our way of living. Trust in Yahweh. He's your Savior. Read it. Isaiah chapter 44. He says it. And he proclaims it all through Scripture. I am your Savior. I am your Deliverer. I am your Redeemer. I am your Rock. I submit to you all that there's no greater name on earth in the name of the Most High El, Shalom.